All right, let's do this. Are we ready? Y'all are out of control today. Maybe I do need this up. All right, so so the next homework is out. Oh, that works. So the next homework is out. Uh, I know you're all thinking about project two right now, so I'm not going to belabor the next project at this point. Uh, but I do just want to give you a little bit of a foreshadow. Uh, for this one, you're allowed to use conditionals again, but we're going to ban var, no variables for this homework. So you have to do everything in an immutable fashion, and we're going to show you how to do that. It's going to force you to use things like first order functions, which we'll introduce today, recursion, which we'll talk about all next week, and immutable objects, which we'll talk about in two weeks. So uh, again, just like banning conditionals, banning var is not... Uh, not a statement. I'm not saying variables are bad by any means. My goodness, you should use variables all the time. Uh, but for this homework assignment, banning variables is, a, is an academic thing to do to force you into learning what we need you to learn for learning objective three. Uh, it forces you into using recursion mostly. It's uh, an effective way to get you to use recursion. And also immutable objects. How to work with immutable objects? It will uh, immutable means they can't change, like val is an immutable variable. If you can use variables, then you know how do I get you to learn about immutability if you just make everything a variable and don't use immutability? Uh, so that's the only reason variables are banned. And also any way of simulating variables, uh, anything against the spirit of the assignment is of course banned as well. Uh, there is, again, some sticker shock when you get to task one. Uh, there's a lot of text for task one, but it's very similar to project two, where task one is a lot of text, uh, but I, I'll argue that it's not too complex as long as you understand what's being presented in lecture. A lot of the text is explanations, examples, things to help you understand what exactly is being asked. Uh, whenever I have confusion in the past, um, you know, some versions, uh, some version of this assignment has been exist in existence for a while. And whenever there's confusion, I like to update the doc and usually I add more text. It does make it a little wordy, but a lot of those words are just to help you, uh, help you understand what exactly is being asked. Uh, the short of it, the short explanation of this is write a method named average that takes the average of some values. Uh, but written in a completely generic way that uses first order functions and type parameters, which we'll learn about today. Uh, top k, give me a top, top top k list. If k is 10, give me a top 10 list, for example. Bayesian average, which is something you probably never heard of before. It's not too complex of a topic, but there's enough confusion on it that I give a lengthy explanation about what Bayesian average actually means. Uh, the short explanation is you add a certain number of fake ratings to a review. Oh, I didn't even say the, the top level what, what we're even doing. Uh, so for this homework, we're going to... Uh, Analyze song ratings and figure out uh, what the best songs are uh, with a one to five rating system. So one to five integer rating system, if I have two songs that I'm comparing, one of those songs has 100 ratings and an average rating of 4.9. If we use our average method, we'll get 4.9. And another song which has one rating and that rating is five. Which song is better? Which song should we rate higher? Well, I would like the 4.9 with 100 ratings personally, but the average rating of the one with one rating of five, well, this has an average rating of five. That's higher than 4.9, so that's a better song, right? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, so Bayesian average is addressing that problem by adding several fake ratings, and we'll stick with two fake ratings of three to every song. Uh, two fake ratings of value three is not going to affect the is not going to affect the song with 100 ratings and average 4.9. That's still going to be 4.9 because those 100 outweigh the two fake ratings by a lot. Uh, but this one with just one rating of 5 is going to drop all the way down to a 3, 6, 7. And that factors in that uncertainty. There's only one person who rated it. We don't really know if this song is good or bad or, or what. Uh, so Bayesian average gets us that, uh, uh, knocks those ones down with fewer ratings and gives us a way to weight the songs with more ratings higher because we have more reliable data. Uh, if we didn't do this, uh, when we get data, uh, there's data in the repo to start from uh, 2021 when students uh, submitted a whole bunch of song ratings. And uh, if we just sorted by average, it's going to be flooded. Our top 20, 50, our top 50 list even, 
top 100 list is going to be dominated by one student really like that song and put in their favorite song and nobody else cares about that song. We don't want that being our top 50 list. Uh, so Bayesian average is going to address that problem. And finally, a cost function. We're going to write a method that returns a function, uh, which is one of the things we'll learn about starting Wednesday, how to write a method that returns a function. And that is going to give some sort of cost to songs, which says how bad the song is, a lower cost being a, a better song. And we're going to take a specific user's ratings into account when we write that. Uh, so just a quick overview on task one. I don't want to talk about too much of it because most of it's not going to make much sense um, if I go into more detail than I just did. Uh, but there's a lot of text here for task one. But again, a lot of it is explanation of what you're supposed to do. Uh, so don't feel too overwhelmed looking at it. It's a lot of text to parse through. Uh, but what I'm eventually asking you to actually code isn't too incredible. Um, you'll, you'll, of course, have to understand the material of the week. But it's not overwhelming. I'll, I'll uh, stand by that one. You can disagree by the end of it if, if you want. But I, I don't think it's too overwhelming. I think it's appropriate for a week's worth of content. Uh, and then I won't go into the, the rest of them right now. You can look through the document on your own. Yeah, just refresh the page. You'll, you'll be able to see that. But if you had the tab open for a while, you will have to refresh. Uh, I posted it late last night. So if you haven't refreshed since last night, you have to refresh. Yeah, veil is fine. So you can only use veil when you declare your local variables. Anything else I missed? Uh, is, is the LO2 quiz going to be similar in difficulty to LO1? The LO2 quiz is going to be, I would argue, much more difficult than the LO1 quiz. Uh, you, you know a lot more stuff at this point. With the LO1 quiz, there were, really wasn't much we could quiz you on. Most of what we do in LO1 is just reviewing 115, but in Scala. Uh, and then unit testing, which we don't put on the quiz. And the only thing we could talk about is stack memory. So just how do variable stack frames and, uh, and code blocks go on the stack? Not much we can really quiz you on. Like uh, even the three questions we gave you were a little bit repetitive. It's the same things over and over. Um, LO2, there's just a lot more we get to talk about. Uh, how, do, how do you create a class and then create new objects of that type? And how do those objects go on the heap with references on the stack? And then how does that change when we add inheritance to the mix? When I have a class that extends another class and I create a new object of that, how do all the state variables get collected from both classes? Uh, and then finally, polymorphism. How do, when we have a variable of one type storing an object of another type and I call a method on that object, which method is called? Is it the one from the abstract class? Is it the one from the concrete class? Uh, what's being called there? So there's just a lot more that uh, we're pitting, putting on the quiz a lot more that we can assess for three weeks. Most of what we talked about for the past three weeks is all quiz worthy material. Uh, so in that sense, there's just a lot more content and a lot, a lot more to talk about. Uh, so yeah, it'll be more difficult than LO1. LO1 was just like, can you show me that you understood what a memory diagram is and the notation of it? Um, we weren't really assessing very much there. Does a variable in a for loop count as a var? Um, no. No. Uh, you can use loops in the homework. In homework three. Oh, Nicholas already answered. I, I always got to read your answers before I, I go on a, an explanation. All right, any other questions? Let's talk about sorting. Ooh, yeah. Sorting revisited with first order functions. So you sorted before. Uh, we sorted in this class. We just called dot sorted, and, and that's it. We moved on. Um, let's talk about that more in depth. Uh, and you talked about sorting in 115. I'll give you a heads up. Uh, sorting is something you're going to talk about a lot throughout computer science. We just love talking about sorting. Don't ask me why. We just, uh, we just really enjoy it as a teaching tool. Usually when sorting is being brought up, it'll, it was brought up last semester, it's brought up this semester, it'll be brought up in 250, it'll be brought up in 331. Uh, you're going to see sorting over and over and over again. 
Um, the reason we like talking about sorting, one, it's something you already understand intuitively. Like I don't have to explain to you what sorting is. If, if I asked you to, uh, to sort, if I hand you something and said sort these, you know, just physical objects, you know what sorting means. Um, so we can use that and leverage it to talk about whatever concepts we want to talk about at the time. When it was in 115, we just straight up wanted to talk about sorting. How do you sort, uh, maybe data structures, I guess it would be. How do you sort the values in a data structure? Here, I want to talk about first order functions is going to be the lead in. So we're going to remind you what sorting is. And then I'm going to talk about first order functions. That's what I want to talk about today. And I'm using sorting as a vehicle to explain that. In 250, you're going to talk about runtime analysis and proofs. And again, sorting, specifically merge sort, is going to be a vehicle to talk about that. And I'll talk about merge sort next week when we talk about recursion. I'm going to use merge sort to explain recursion. In 250, they're going to use merge sort to talk about runtime analysis and proofs. And then in 331, uh, sorting again, again with merge sort, and again for proofs. Actually, I don't know if 250 does the proof of correctness, just the runtime. And then 331 is going to bring in merge sort to do the proof of correctness. So just a heads up, because uh, as a student, whenever I saw sorting, I tuned out right away. Like sorting, I know how to sort. Uh, and then I zoned out, and then I missed the runtime analysis in 250. And then it's like, oh, wait, you were actually showing me something there, not just sorting for the fifth time. Um, so I just want to give you a heads up. You're going to see sorting a lot. Uh, we did this before. We called dot sorted. That returned a new list with the same values as the original list, but in sorted order. That much we know. Today, I want to talk about how this is done and how we're going to do custom sorting. You did custom sorting in, in uh, 115. Very briefly, we just said this takes a, a function and, and kind of moved on. Uh, now we want to talk about how that worked. So when we call dot sorted, we're going to get the elements sorted in a default order. So uh, by using a default comparator, which by default for integers is the less than function. So each element is going to be not greater than the next element. So this is what we call non-decreasing order, which means uh, this element and the next element, this less than this, is going to be, um, I'm going to say it all wrong. Why am I even going down this explanation? Uh, this less than this will be false. Yeah, that, that's, that gets us there. So. We use the less than comparator to be able to get these elements in the correct order. And the comparator is eventually what we're going to talk about in depth. So what if we don't want to use the default comparator? What if we want to use something else? Well, we have other methods built in Scala to be able to let us do that. We have the sort by method, which is going to take a function. Yay, that's what we, the big topic we want to talk about. This is going to take a function. And it's going to apply that function to every element of the list and then sort by the outputs of that function. So <laughs> sort by at math.absolute value is going to take this function, technically a method, but we're not going to get tripped up on the vocab. And it's going to call math.absolute value on every element and then sort by the outputs of that function. So we're going to sort 5, 23, 8, 7, 4, and 10 without any of the negatives. Sort based on the outputs of that function, and then we get our new sorted order based on that function. And this is something we can do. This is something you did in 115, so it's, this shouldn't be too much of a shock, uh, where in Python you had um, you sorted based on a key, and that key was a function, and you would get that different sorting, that custom sorting in Python. So nothing new there, but we want to talk about the internals eventually. And then we also have another way to sort in Scala, which is going to be more similar to how you sorted in JavaScript last semester. So what if we want to sort something that's not by the default order? So for example here, we sorted by the output of this function on each element. But we still got the default sorting. It was still sorting the integers in non-decreasing value using the less than operator. But what if we wanted something that's not the default ordering? Well, then we can give it call sort with instead of sort by and give this a function which is going to look more like your JavaScript comparator 
from last semester. It's going to follow the same rules as that comparator. It's going to be a function that takes two inputs and returns a Boolean. That Boolean is going to be true if the first parameter should come before the second parameter in the final sorted order, and false otherwise, including ties. So the less than operator gives us this functionality. If we say 5 less than negative 23, that's going to be false, because the first param which tells us that the first parameter does not come before the second one in that sorted order. And then we can reverse the inputs and say negative 23 less than 5, uh, true. Therefore, the first parameter, negative 23 in that example, comes before 5 in the sorted order. And if I want to override that, I'm going to give this the greater than function. I'm going to say greater than instead of less than. And with that change of the comparator, I can get a different order. And I can change the, the comparator to whatever I want as long as it satisfies these, this protocol and get whatever sorted order I want. So we give sort with a comparator that returns true if the first input it should come before the second one and false otherwise. And then sort with is just going to sort based on that comparator. So this is a first order function. I'll sometimes say first class function and first order function. I'll use them interchangeably. Technically, it should be first class function, um, but I'll use them interchangeably. And I know Paul is using first order function, so uh, I'll try to keep saying first order. Uh, this is our first order function. This is a function that takes two ints and returns the first int greater than the second int, which happens to be of type Boolean. And that's what we're going to use as the input to the sort with method. So get used to seeing this syntax. So let's break this apart a little bit. I want to talk about what that first order function is. And to do that, I'm going to define it on its own line so we can see all the types and how to, uh, how to do this. So first order function or first class function, the idea of this is that functions are just like any other value in our program. Functions are like any other value, which means they can be stored in variables. They can be passed as, parameter, or passed as arguments. They can be defined as parameters. And they can even be the return type of a method. So the, all those things we can do, like we can do with any type, like we created classes, and then we could use that type. We defined a brand new type, and we could use that anywhere in our program. Parameters, return types, variables. We can do the same thing with functions in Scala. This is one of the big reasons why Scala, why not Java or, uh, or C++, C++, there's a lot of reasons not to. Um, but why not Java? It's because Java makes it way more painful to do first order functions. It's one of the big reasons. Java, uh, Scala, you just create a first order function. Like all functions are just first order, first class. Uh, so we're going to create the function just like we did before. And we're going to assign it equal to a variable. And the type of the variable is going to define the types of the inputs and outputs of that function. So this is the type of the variable that stores this function. The type is a function that takes two ints and returns a Boolean. And here's another instance of those big arrows. Scala developers, that they just love these arrows. This arrow is going to separate the parameter types and the return type in the type and also the definition of the function itself. So that big arrow equal greater than is going to say, OK, I'm done with the parameter list, and I'm moving on to the actual definition of this function. What happens if we compare different types? Good question. Uh, if you compare different types, you'd have to write a function to be able to do that. Comparators have to take two inputs of the same type. 
So they could be different types if you're leveraging polymorphism. If I had a comparator of like game objects and then compare them by their mass and then compare health potions and, and uh, uh, dodgeballs. But the comparator, the, both inputs have to be the same type. And they have to match the type of the list that you're sorting. So numbers is, I should put my type parameter here, but numbers is a list of ints. So the comparator that sort with takes is going to have to take two ints as parameters. There's no other choice. A anything else, you're going to get errors. Uh, but if you use polymorphism, it's perfectly valid. So any function that has a return not equal to unit is a first order function? Not necessarily. And I could have a first order function that returns unit. I can change this to unit. Um, first order functions, I mean, technically all of our functions are, or rather, first class functions. Uh, everything in Scala is a first class function. Uh, but now we're going to start taking advantage of that fact and uh, using the idea that we can store functions and variables and pass them to methods. Not quite. <coughs> so this is the definition of a function. This is like, uh, this is creating an object, um, kind of like saying new function uh, by using this syntax. We're going to create a parameter list, just like we do for methods. Create a parameter list. Each parameter has to have a name and a type. And we're going to use the big arrow, equal, greater than, and then the definition of that method, all the code that should run when this, uh, when this function is called. So very similar to methods, except we're using this arrow instead of an equal sign, because our equal sign here is defined, uh, is reserved for, uh, for the assignment operator. We can use the same thing that we do for methods, where we say equal and then the body of the method. So that's our definition of the, meth the function itself. And we can use the same syntax that we do for methods where we use braces. If we want more room or we just want to be more explicit or for whatever reason, uh, or uh, mostly if you want more than one line, you can still use this syntax. You can say equals or this whole body. You can give it a whole code block and that function will have that whole definition of the code block. So if you want larger first order functions, like you will when you get to the song cost function, the last part of task one of the project, you're going to want to use these braces because you have to write that whole cost function, which gets kind of lengthy. Yeah? Why would you want to do this as opposed to normal method writing? As opposed to normal method writing? We will get to that. Um, so the short answer is we can have flexible functions. We can create functions on the fly. Uh, let me think of how to word it. We can create functions that are only like partial functions and then at runtime fill in the missing details and have a way to create functions, um, many different types of functions depending on the data of our program. So for the song cost function, for an example, we're going to rate songs. We're going to assign costs to songs, not just on the reviews of that song, but also on the reviews of a specific user. So we want to cost of the song, not just the, uh, the absolute cost of the song, but how much will this user like this song? So we're going to write a cost function that takes those, that user's ratings into account in the function itself, which we won't know at the time that we write the function. Like we can't write a method with, uh, I can't write a method with your song preferences built into the method because I only get one shot to write it. But if we build the function at runtime, I can take whatever ratings you give me and then return a function that's specific to your ratings. And then I can create like 100 functions. I can create a function for everybody uh, in the room based on all your ratings. You know, give my program your ratings and, and I have 100 uh, functions, different functions floating around in the code. Uh, whereas with methods, I would have to have one object or class with 100 different definitions that I have to cut and paste and, and change. So it gives us more flexibility is the, the shorter answer. We're kind of avoiding states with this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I, I, should, I should mention that. Thank you. I should mention that more explicitly. So OOP is one solution, one way of approaching a, a problem, uh, the problem of how do we write software. Uh, OOP is one paradigm of, of doing that, one way of approaching things. 
FP is another choice. Like there are two different ways of approaching, there are more than two, but these are the two we're talking about in this class. These are two different ways of approaching software engineering or writing software. Uh, a lot of the same problems that we were solving with OOP, we're gonna see different ways of solving them using functional programming. So you will see that a lot. Like we can swap out the behavior of things using polymorphism and we could have methods that depend on the state of an object. That would be the OOP way of doing the same thing. We would have your song preferences stored in the state of the object and then the method would take that state into consideration. And then that state would have to be mutable. Uh, the whole idea of functional programming is to get rid of the uh, mutability. That's getting a little too deep though. Um, uh, that would be the OOP way of doing it. The functional programming way of doing it is just give me the data in a function and then we'll let that function do the, uh, have the flexibility. Uh, and immutability, I'll say one more thing on this. Um, the immutability aspect, so why functional programming at all, why not OOP, everything. Uh, the immutability aspect, the th this idea that your data can't change ever uh, is really beneficial in a few aspects of computer science. One, you know your data is just not changing, uh, which is nice in general, but it's nice for concurrent programming. If you're writing programs where multiple things are happening simultaneously, if you have two pieces of code running, you have a well, multi-threaded piece of software, and they're both accessing the same data, and that data might be changing, you, you might have really complex bugs to be able to debug. One solution to this, the functional programming solution, the functional programming approach is to say, your data can't change, end of story. Your data can't change. And then two, uh, two pieces of code accessing the same data doesn't have to worry about it because the data can't change. And then if you want to change, you have to create new data that's a copy of that with the change applied. This is helpful with multi-threaded programming and then especially distributed programming where you have one program that's running across multiple machines. Uh, think, for example, like YouTube. Uh, YouTube can't run on a single machine. It simply cannot fit. I don't care how big your supercomputer is, YouTube ain't running on a single machine. It has to be distributed. The YouTube app has to be distributed over multiple machines. In fact, it's distributed over multiple data centers all across the world. So when you go to YouTube.com, that request can be handled by some machine somewhere. But all those machines have to share data. They have to share all the videos. You request a video, uh, whatever machine you're talking to, your laptop's talking to, needs to be able to get to that video. So it's one big app that's distributed across many, many machines. If the data is constantly changing out from underneath these machines that need to all work together as a big network uh, to enable YouTube, um, things, are gonna, things are gonna go south real quick. So if we have data that can't change, data that's immutable, and functions that don't rely on data, these functions aren't going to rely on the current state of an object, everything's going to be set in stone. A function is going to have a fixed input output behavior. It doesn't have a reference to this. It can't access any state that can change. These are strictly like mathematical functions. When we're talking about functions, strict input output behavior, not relying on the state of an object. Uh, that's a very important property to have when you have a distributed system, you're leveraging multi-threading, things like that. Uh, so this is kind of a, a somewhat at least a fact of life. Usually our programs are gonna have a mix of FP and OOP in procedural programming, which is what you do in 115, uh, before you know about either of these. So, uh, so this is kind of a fact of life that we have distributed systems. If you have an app with a million users, you have to be distributed. So we need to address these problems of data can change. So that's a little more in depth than I, I meant to go into there. Um, but that's a lot of the reason why we're talking about first order functions and functional programming in general. Back, back to, uh, let, me, let me bring it back down. Uh, so we can use braces in our code. That's a, that's a hard shift. <laughs> Uh, so we can define these just like we define methods. We have our parameter list. Instead of just an equal sign, we have this arrow, this big arrow, and then the definition of the function. The, and then I'll go back to the more compact syntax right here. Uh, and then the type is going to match the types 
of the inputs and the type of the output. That's going to be the type of any variables or any parameters or any return types. It's going to be the types of the inputs and the type of the return value. So this is read just like any other variable declaration. I create my variable, I name it, I specify its type, I set it, assign it equal to some value, and that value just happens to be a function, the type happens to be a function, but everything else is the same, just the type looks a little different, and the definition of that variable, or the value, looks a little different. Which is always confusing because there's three equal signs here. So your eyes don't know where to look for the, the more meaningful stuff. This is the most meaningful equal sign. This is the assignment. And then we have the right-hand side of the assignment and the left-hand side of the assignment. Uh, would this be the same as saying def comparator? Uh, there are nuanced differences, but nothing I want to talk about at the moment because uh, I already got sidetracked a bit and I got to get through these slides. Yeah? When you plug in comparator, does it dot sort with? Does it just take random elements of the list or does it go from like left to right? That is an excellent question. <laughs> uh, so it'll be based on Scala's built in sorting method which will be a variation of merge sort, which we'll talk about starting Monday. Uh, but it won't be random and it won't be in order, but it will have a very defined algorithm that chooses which two to compare at which times. And we can even pass methods. So if we do wanna just define methods, I have a method, and this would be in an animal class. I'm not going to write the whole code on the slides. But def compare animals takes two animals and returns a Boolean. As long as you're sorting something, I'm sorting a list of animals, as long as you're sorting something of a specific type and you give it a comparator of that type that can compare two elements of that type, you can use sort with. And you can even use that with methods. You don't even have to use <coughs> functions. The method will be converted to a function when you call this, uh, call this sort with. So we can do this as well. So here I want to sort my animals by name, and I want to ignore case. So I'm going to convert them both to lowercase and then use the less than comparator, which will compare by ASCII values. And that will give me a sorting that I want, where uh, Morris would be the first element if I didn't do this, if I just did animals.sorted. It will take capitalization into account. All right, how does this work? So let's talk about sorting. Talk about selection sort. I believe you did this in 115. I, I believe they still do selection sort. So I'm not going to belabor the algorithm itself, uh, but I do want to focus on the comparator. When we run through this algorithm, we gloss over the details in 115, but when we go through this algorithm, what this is going to do is select the, uh, the, the inconvenient. Um, it's going to choose two elements at a time, call the comparator to see which one should come first, and then sort based on the answer of that decision. So selection sort, the algorithm is going to choose an index, start with the first index, and then go through the whole list, find the minimum value. I think this is how we explain it in 115 still. Find the minimum value in the list, and then swap those values. Swap the value at index 0 with the element, the minimum element of the array, and then that element is frozen. The element at index 0 is set. It will be negative 23. We know that's the minimum value according to the comparator, so that has to be the first value. Then we go to the next index, figure out what should be here. It should be negative 8, swap, then negative 4, swap. That's our overall algorithm. The way we're doing that is by comparing only two elements at a time. That's all sort with can do. You only gave it a comparator that takes two elements and returns a Boolean. That's the only information it needs to get the job done. So that's the only thing it can do. So let's take a look at how this, how this works. So to find that minimum element, we're going to compare 5 and negative 23. And assuming we're using our less than comparator here, we're going to say 
is 5 less than 23? And the answer is false. So we know that, I'm saying that backwards, ain't I? Is 23 less than 5? If the answer is, uh, the answer is true, so we found a new candidate for our lowest, uh, for our first element, and then keep going down the list. Is 23 less than 8? False. So 23 is still our candidate. 23 less than 7? False. 23 less than negative 4? False. 23 less than 10? False. So we know we got to the end of the list, and 23 is our current lowest element. So then we perform our swap. Then we do the same thing with the next, uh, next one. Is 5 less than negative 8, which is false. So we're going to take negative 8. I meant true with those ones. I meant true each time. I said false each time, didn't I? Uh, is 5 less than negative 8? False. So 8, negative 8 is our new candidate. Is 8 less than 7? True. 8, negative 8 less than negative 4? True. Negative 8 less than, uh, less than 10? True. So swap negative 8 with index 1. 5 less than 7, true. So 5 is our candidate. 5 less than negative 4, false. So negative 4 becomes our candidate. Negative 4 less than 10, true. Negative 4 is our winner. And we go through the whole thing. Uh, sometimes we'll swap something with itself, but that's fine. And we eventually get to the full sorted order of our, uh, of our list. So whenever we asked a question about the ordering of two elements, we only asked one question. We said, does this element come before this one? True or false? And then ties can be broken arbitrarily. So if it, the answer is false, we'll just keep our current candidate or, or swap the, I, I'm confusing myself on that, the, the way ties work. It's not important to what we're talking about anyway. It, and I'm just going to spend forever uh, thinking about it. Uh, so. In our code, that's what this, uh, this is what it's going to look like. This is doing exactly what we just did on the previous slide. And I know there are vars in this example before somebody calls me out on it. There is a version of this in the repo which does not use var, uh, but it's a little too much for what we're doing right now. I think I'll show it in lecture Friday, maybe, um, if you want to see the no var version of this. Uh, but it's just a little more difficult to read especially because you've had half a lecture on functional programming so far. It's a little tough to, to see all that stuff. Uh, so I'm going to keep create a brand new list. Um, no, I'm not. <laughs> I literally have a comment right there that says I don't do that. I'm going to create a reference to the list as a variable. So you can't change the inputs. Inputs are always vales. And I want to be able to change this to do the swaps, um, to do the swaps here. So I'm going to create a reference to that, which is going to be a var, so I can do those swaps. And I'm going to iterate through the indices. For each indice, I want to find which value should end up in that indice, and then swap those values. Do that for each indice. And the only thing that I'm doing here. Everything here is completely generic, no matter how I'm sorting. But I'm taking in a comparator that takes two ints and returns a Boolean. And I'm calling that comparator right here. So I'm nowhere in this method do I say, we're going to compare uh, sort ints in increasing order or decreasing order in, or, or in order of absolute value. I'm never specifying that in my method. Instead, I'm taking in a function that's going to be my comparator. And then whenever I have to ask two elements about their relative ordering, I'm going to pull out that comparator and say, should this value come before this one? If it should, then I know that that's my new minimum element found. It won't necessarily be a min. It will just be positionally earlier than, uh, than the other one. If the comparator is the less than function, I'm going to get increasing sorted. If it's the greater than method, I'll get decreasing order in my sorting method. But everything hinges right here. And the advantage of this, the why functional programming, the why functions at all, is I write one sorting method ever. One. One time I ever want to think about sorting. 
And then I use that method no matter how I want to sort. I just give it different comparators. I give it a different comparator if I want to sort game objects, if I want to sort animals, if I want to sort, oh, oh sorry, I, we, I didn't get there yet. If I want to sort increasing, decreasing, or absolute value, uh, or by, I always want to say like by the square root or something, but that's the same order as the, uh, uh, as just sorting them normally. Uh, but I can sort them based on however I want, based on the comparator. So I get a lot more leverage out of my one method that I wrote. And in fact, Scala's built-in sorting method, there's only one built-in sorting, I mean, there might be one or two, but there's only one that we ever use, sorted, sort with, sort by. We're using the same code that the Scala developers wrote. Scala developers never knew you were going to write a class named game object and have this polymorphism and all this other stuff. They never knew that, but their code, their sorting method still works on your classes that they've never even heard of. And this is one way that we can do it, by being very flexible in the way we write our code. If we take in a function, we can get a lot more mileage out of one chunk of code than if we hard-coded everything. Uh, where the OOP equivalent, since I talked about it earlier, the OOP equivalent would be to create a new object of a type that has a comparator as a state variable and then, um, and then call that comparator from using this dot comparator. <clears throat> uh, and a sample usage, very similar to sort with. I'm going to give it the values I want to sort, the list, and my comparator function. And then that's going to return a new list with those values in sorted order. Uh, yeah, data.updated is going to update a value at a certain position in the list and replace that value with another value. Very slow operation with lists, by the way. It's an LO4 topic, though. This is very slow. Okay, but we got a, a problem. Uh, the method I just showed only works for ints. What if I want to sort animals? What if I want to sort game objects? What if I want to do... Uh, sort my game objects by mass or something like that. Uh, or sort my game objects by their distance to the player. So it's something I might want to do. If a player wants to know which objects are close by, um, that's going to be something we might want to do in a game. So what if I want to sort things that aren't ints? Well, for that, we're going to use what's called a type parameter. So we're getting a lot of flexibility here by taking in functions. And now we're going to take in a type parameter which is going to look like this. So there's actually another parameter list that we can add to our methods that's going to take in a type. So for this, we use the square brackets. Specify, uh, not specify, but take in a variable. This is going to be whatever name I want. Uh, choose whatever name you want here. I named it type. And that's going to take in the type when this method is called. So this method, wherever we see type, a list of type, a list of type, a method that takes two types, uh, returns a list of type. Type is a variable, and that's going to be determined when the method is called. So when the method is called and we decide we want the selection sort that we saw before, we're going to specify the type as int. And we're going to give it a list of ints, a comparator that takes two ints. We're going to return a list of ints, and this will be a list of ints. But if we want to sort animals, we're going to say, hey, selection, uh, selection sort, the type is now animal. And then type will be replaced by animal. We'll have a list of animals. A comparator that takes two animals will return a list of animals. And that list will be a type of animal. That list will be animals here. So we have two parameter lists, the type parameter list, and then the standard parameter list that we've been using since 115. When we have type parameters, it's common practice across the industry to just use single characters. This is one time where we're in line with mathematics with all their single character variables. Uh, we typically just use one single variable for our type parameter. So it'll usually be like A or B uh, for a map. They're K and V for key, key and value. Um, I'll do T right here because I had type on the previous slide. I just shortened it to T. We typically just use one character names for these, for type parameters. 
And now we have a completely generic selection sort method. There's no stopping what you can sort with this thing. We can sort any type by any comparator. And this is the only sorting method we would have to write, aside from performance, which we'll talk about, because it's slow as, slow as crap. But we can sort anything in any way. Very, very flexible method by using just a little bit of, just a little sprinkling of functional programming. Gets us a way to define the algorithm separate from what we're doing and how we're doing it, and just writing one generic algorithm. And now we want to sort those animals. When we call the method, we can specify the type parameter, uh, which is, oh, and I, I should mention, it's very similar. It's the same idea as when you create like a new map and you have to specify the type parameters. A new list, you have to specify the type parameters. Uh, same idea, but now that parameter is flexible. We're on the other side. Like if you look at the list or map class or array class, they have type parameters in those classes. That's how we're allowed to create a list of whatever we want. It's type parameters. So we can specify the type parameter when we call the method. We can call this method on the next line with a type parameter of int. The same method call can have two different type parameters if we call it two different times. But we usually don't do that. You've called methods before that, have type, that take type parameters. You never had to care about it. Uh, because Scala will infer these quite reliably. We're giving this selection sort a list of animals. We're giving it a comparator, a method, a function that takes two animals. Scala's going to figure it out and be like, yeah, I'm, I'm guessing T's animal. Uh, so we usually don't specify the type parameters because it can be inferred by the regular parameters that we give it. It's, of course, going to be a type parameter of animal because these are animals. This takes animals. We got you. Scala's got us there. Uh, this method is extremely slow. Uh, you talked about this briefly in 115. This is very slow. The algorithm itself is n squared. And my implementation of it, just because I was sloppy with the way I use lists, is actually n cubed. Very, very slow. Uh, I do have an n squared. Uh, implementation that doesn't use var, it's in the repo, uh, you can take a look at. But it's very slow. On Monday, we'll talk about merge sort a week from now, or two weeks from now, that will be a little faster. But we'll have to wait a bit for that one. And sorry, I got us at 350 again, but not too bad since I got pretty far off track at one point. Um, but we got the, the lecture question here. So as always, once you finish the question, you can, uh, you can head out. Uh, have a great day, and I'll see you Wednesday.